manner because at the higher salary of professors I would indeed prefer to be a professor over being a gardener. Well, I'm so very the, happy that you're a professor. <laughs> good. The one reason for giving differential salaries is then to achieve a better allocation of people over positions, that the people who are really good at a certain job will go after that job, the people who are talented for that job. And the other reason is that you will find that people who are good at something will vary their hours depending on how much they get paid. So if you pay people extra for putting in extra hours or for working especially hard, mm -hmm. then you get them to work especially hard. So a person who is, let's say, a teacher, uh, if the teacher knows exactly what salary she will get, regardless of how well she teaches, she may not try very hard to be a good teacher. But if the salary depends on how good a teacher she is, then she will try extra hard to be a good teacher with successful students in order to increase her income. So that's the second reason for allowing differences in income even within the same job. Mm -hmm. So, so your, your argument is that, the, the, that we should have a little more pay but it shouldn't be extreme, say, like 300 times like it is now. Uh, well, that's exactly the question. The question is how big should these differences be? Yeah. And uh, the rich are always saying, let these differences be determined by the free market and let there be a bidding war for my talent. Let everybody bid and so on. But Rawls is saying with this difference principle, we should moderate these inequalities through the tax system to muffle them, to make them smaller through progressive taxes insofar as that raises the bottom socioeconomic position. Exactly. Um, I had a question here for you related to Kant. Uh, you've published uh, widely uh, on, on Kant and I wanted to just um, get you to comment on Kant's role, say 300 years ago, and now the United Nations today. A lot of folks maybe not, maybe haven't even read the United Nations and don't know the underpinnings of it. Yeah, so uh, I think Kant was much more influential for the predecessor of the United Nations, the League of Nations. And even the word League of Nations is one that this expression is one that uh, Kant coined in his famous essay, Perpetual Peace, where he proposed something like a League of Nations. The difference is, I think, that the League of Nations was even more than the United Nations, a club of governments, where the principle of sovereignty, of national sovereignty, uh, was fundamental, and there weren't many constraints on what governments could do within their own borders. The United Nations has gone further in that direction in formulating certain basic rights of individuals and authorizing the United Nations to protect these rights to some extent. So we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, uh, the two covenants on civil and political human rights and on uh, social, economic and cultural human rights. And we also have in the Charter specific provisions that authorize the Security Council to intervene to protect uh, the uh, peace if human rights problems spill over from one country to another. It's still not very extensive a system of protecting individuals, but it's more extensive than what we had in the League of Nations. Now, uh, Kant was very much in favor of such rights, but Kant also thought that these rights should be fought over only domestically. So he was not in favor of interstate intervention, humanitarian interventions and so on. He thought that each state should, in domestic struggles, develop itself into a republic, which was his word for a democratic state in which the legislative power is exercised by the people. 
so he did not think that serious governance authority should be shifted upward from the nation state level to supranational institutions. And of course, exactly this shifting upward is what we have now. We have the World Trade Organization, we have various other international agencies, uh, the UN Security Council, also regional organizations such as ASEAN, uh, the European Union and so on, which are accumulating considerable governance functions and powers. And that is something that Kant opposed largely on the conception that if you have divided authority in the vertical dimension, you will get disputes over who is in charge of what uh, decision, and these disputes could unravel the entire political system. They have the potential of leading to physical altercations, to war, civil war, and so on. The current uh, on-the-ground work that you're doing with the Health Impact Fund and Environmental Impact Fund, uh, these are the practical and applied ethics that you've been speaking all over the world about and they can be seen on YouTube. So can you give us just a couple comments? Yeah, so the, the very basic idea is that we are doing a poor job in incentivizing innovation. Innovation is a wonderful thing in this world. It brings us all sorts of new technologies, new ideas, new knowledge, new learning from which uh, we benefit as you can easily see by looking back 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, how people lived. We are living much better today, at least in the richer parts of the world, thanks to all these wonderful innovations. Now, innovations uh, are not cost-free. They cost money to achieve. And people will be much more willing to innovate and invest in innovation if they get rewarded for innovation. This is, again, a wonderful illustration of what we talked about before, the difference principle, that even those who are not able to innovate are better off if the innovators make a good salary, uh, get good income, good rewards, because that way more innovation is forthcoming, and even the non-innovators can lead much better lives thanks to the innovations that the innovators are achieving. But now comes the question, what sort of rewards do we pay the innovators? How do we reward them? The standard way of rewarding innovation in our world is that we give innovators a temporary monopoly. So we let them be the sole sellers of a certain new product for a limited period of time, normally 20 years or so. And so if you have a patent, then you are the only one who can make and sell the object that is patented, maybe a new pill or a new seed or a new piece of music or whatever it is for a certain period of time. And that enables you to sell it at an especially high markup. So instead of, as in the normal economy, adding 20% or 30% to the cost of production, you can actually raise the cost of production by a factor of 40 or 50. So often medicines that can be produced for maybe five cents per pill are selling for five dollars per pill or for three dollars per pill. In fact, you say that that first pill cost uh, 250 million dollars. Every pill after I, it costs five cents. Five cents, that's right. <laughs> and so innovators can recoup their cost of innovation, the cost of inventing and testing a new pill or a new seed or whatever the technology is, uh, by charging the first so many users a very high markup. Now the problem with that reward system is quite obvious. The problem is that this wonderful innovation does not diffuse well. It does not reach everybody because those people who are poor cannot get access to the innovation in the first 10 or 15 years that it's on the market in that monopoly period. And that's very regrettable because we have the innovation, it's there, and it doesn't cost anybody anything to let everybody use it, let, let the poor people have it too. So take the example of drugs, of medicines. 
uh, you have a wonderful new drug for a deadly disease. You can now, with the innovation, you can make this drug at five cents a copy, and poor people can easily pay five cents a copy. It's no big deal. They can do it. But it's being sold at three dollars per copy, and poor people cannot afford three dollars for a pill. And so what happens then is poor people continue to die of the disease for 10, 15 years until finally the patent expires and generic companies can mass produce the medicine. So is there a better way? Uh, sure, we can say let everybody be free. Let's abolish patents. Let everybody be free to copy the medicine once it is invented. But that is also not a good solution, because if you do that, then there will be very few innovations, because innovators will not spend a lot of money developing a drug and testing it for safety and efficacy if at the end of the process they have to compete with all these free riders who are producing the same drug without ever having done any innovative work. So. The idea then is, my idea, the solution to this problem is to pay the innovators a large reward, but the reward should be paid in a different way. It should be a reward that is based on the quality of the invention and is paid from public funds out of the tax system, out of basically government revenues. So what does it mean to pay according to the quality of the invention? Well, in the healthcare sector, it's very easy. You say, how much health impact does a new medicine have? How much health improvement does it bring? And you pay the invention on that basis. The more people take the medicine and the more the average patient is benefited by the medicine, the more money goes to the innovator. Governments pay that money and the patients who need the drug get the drug at the cost price. They get it basically without any patent raising the price. Mm 